April 8th, 2024. It's 3.04 p.m. And I think we're gonna call this to order. Commissioner, you have to go someplace. Are you gonna come up and no, I'm getting waved off. Okay. All right. Okay. We had a, had a good conversation. Senator Utke um, and Senator Mann were talking about null and void on some thing. Do you have to get that fixed before you present or you're, or you just wanna, you're just gonna do it? So let's do it. Members, the, the agenda should be in front of you. We're gonna look at Senate file 4460, which um, is Senator Mann, and then we're gonna go to Senator Abler. Um, then we're gonna go to Senator Rasmussen. And then, believe it or not, Senator Weber is actually gonna present a bill in this committee. I believe that would be the first time uh, in his 11 years, I think somebody should look back to see that. And I hope he brought donuts uh, for us. So if you see him and he's not bringing donuts, remind him of his ruling. I'm only kidding on that. And then finally, um, after Senator Weber, then we will um, engage in the budget conversation on the human services provisions, modifications on on, um, on the governor and the, and the department's pr proposal on the budget. So, am I forgetting anything? No, everybody's good with that. So, Senator Mann, talk about civil commitment priority, admissions requirements, modifications, prisoner in a correctional facility is not responsible for co-payments for mental health medications, county co-payments, expenses, authorization, and appropriate money. We have two hours to have this conversation. Let's and so, I understand you have a huge A4 amendment. I do. Do you wanna move that? I would love to. Senator Mann moves the A4 amendment. Uh, Senator Utke, you, you're okay with the... Uh, we need to fully explain. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye opposed, same side. <laughs> Senator Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Senate file 4460 as amended is the priority admissions bill. Um, it is a starting point in the Senate to address the lack of capacity we are facing as a state to meet the mental health needs of Minnesotans. Our acute care hospitals are overburdened with patients who are medically discharged but do not have a place to go. Our jails are overburdened with patients who should be in treatment and not in a jail setting. And I would also note that the admission from jails to DCT has more than tripled in the last 10 years. Our healthcare workforce is burnt out and working in increasingly more dangerous situations, but most concerning is that Minnesotans who need specialized care and treatment cannot get the care that they need when they need it. So this bill takes all nine of the priority admission task force recommendations, which we heard in our committee, um, and these include increasing bed capacity, starting a joint incidence collaboration, immediately approving an exception for up to 10 civilly committed individuals waiting in hospitals for a mental health bed, create and implement a new priority admission criteria for DCT facilities, increase access to services provided in the community, start administering medications in jails, relieve the counties of certain DNMC does not meet criteria costs, uh, expedite section 1115 waiver applications for individuals in custody, and lastly, increase the forensic examiner accessibility. So this bill as it stands, Mr. Chair, costs like a mere around $150 million. Uh, but we are talking about it today because we need to understand the full scope of everything that we need uh, and the cost of the issue before that we can be intentional about our next steps. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will let the testifiers get to it. Thank you, Senator Mann. I, I, I'm still a little, um, I lost my sheet. Oh, here it is. When you said 150 million, and when I saw what our target was, it's, <laughs> I looked over at Senator Utke, and I didn't have to get his piece of paper that, that usually has that. the yeah. dollar sign on that. So it's like <laughs> Senator Abler. Sure. Well, Senator Mann, welcome. We've been talking about this topic. Uh, what's the source of this delete all? Is this from the department, or is this basically? Mr. Chair. Senator Mann. So this is uh, 18 stakeholders have been having uh, meetings twice a week for the last couple of months to come up with all this language. And that's where it comes from, from the 18 different stakeholders. Senator Abler. All right, I'll listen to the testimony. Thank yep, you. Thank you. And then, uh, you got Dr. Ian Heath. I think everybody's here. No, 
Uh, you got Sheriff Brian Welk, all the way from Cass County, Minnesota. I hope he was able to see the uh, uh, whatever that thing that happened today that nobody else got to see because it was so cloudy outside. He's going to join us on Zoom. Elliot Boutte is here, and, and uh, Commissioner Clark is here as well. So, do you want Ian and um, Dr. Ian Heath and uh, Elliot? Do you guys want to come on down and join um, the good Senator Man, and then we'll go. Uh, Dr. Heath and then go to Sheriff Welk if he's, he's uh, yeah, I see him up there, so. Um. Dr. Heath, welcome to the committee. For your, uh, for the record, please state your name and. and sure, it's uh, and, Ian James Heath. And well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, my name's Ian Heath, I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I started my career working for state operator forensic services but for the last 17 years I've worked at Hennepin Healthcare System. I'm currently their senior medical director for the Department of Psychiatry. As the committee is aware, HCMC is a safety net hospital caring for those afflicted with mental illness, substance use disorders, and cognitive disorders, many of whom have had histories of contact with law enforcement. We're used to dealing with complex cases. We've partnered with direct care and treatment, the Department of Corrections, providing care for many patients. As you're aware, in 2013, the priority of mission law was enacted. As an unintended consequence of the enactment of that law, HCMC and other greater metro hospitals are no longer able to gain access to direct care and treatment beds. We lost uh, HCMC, sent a patient to the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center in 2021. So it's been years uh, where we've been precluded from sending patients to Anoka. Um, we also provide services in the jail, the psychiatric services in the Hennepin County Jail. And we understand uh, that both uh, law enforcement has need for beds in terms of the, uh, getting patients out of jail, but also uh, community hospitals also need to be able to access that level of care. Um, much of what I'm, I'm stating, I think, is generalizable to other metro hospitals. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the things that we're facing, uh, we currently have patients that have been admitted to the hospital for years. Um, literally, we've had a couple patients now over two years. We have uh, individuals who are, who are indeterminately civilly committed as mentally ill and dangerous who are stuck uh, in our hospital. Uh, we have one gentleman who was assaulted on over 120 occasions during his approximate two year long stay. And he is uh, uh, basically detained in the hospital waiting transfer to a uh, Minnesota Security Hospital bed. Um, however, as you know, uh, direct current treatment is mandated to accept individuals from jails over the community hospitals. The consequences and cost of uh, uh, attempting to care for an individual in this situation are enormous. Uh, this particular patient's been on a two to one, so one nurse, one mental health worker with him at all times. Uh, from a patient perspective, the patient is unable to advance in their treatment, the physical plant uh, is insufficient to care for someone with this level of violence risk. Uh, patients have no access to fresh air. It's essentially we're uh, trying to care for a patient in an environment that was not designed for it and it has uh, uh, limited uh, opportunities for the patient to progress in their treatment. Um, just for this one particular patient, we likely could have admitted 70 to 100 other patients into that one bed uh, during that uh, two year time frame. So it has a big consequence in terms of throughput uh, for other people in the community also who need that level of care. So I respectfully ask for your support in alleviating some of these challenges. Um, as you're aware, there's an exception to the, primary, to the priority admissions law asking for 10 patients to move as soon as plausible from community hospitals to uh, direct care and treatment beds. Uh, we also would certainly support an increase in the number of direct care and treatment beds and uh, increasing services throughout the mental health system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heath. Any questions for the good doctor? Senator Atke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's just a, you mentioned uh, the one individual that's been with you a couple years um, injuring hospital staff and all of that, waiting for an opening. Do we know if there's been an opening at, and, and this would be probably St. Peter would be a place where that individual would have to go, right? Yes. Have they Dr. not Heath had any openings that, or you just keep drawing the short straw? 
Dr. Heath. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, essentially, individuals who are in jails are taken over individuals in community hospitals. So this individual has been perpetually dropped on the list when someone in jail uh, uh, requires admission to state-operated forensic services. So what's happened is he's been perpetually deep uh, bumped to the bottom of the list. So he, he's never going to go. Um, I, I would certainly, mm -hmm. as someone who's worked for state-operated forensic services, I have a lot of respect for them. And they are doing their best, I know. But they're limited. And they have to comply with the, the 48-hour rule. Senator Ecke. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Um, it's, it's a huge issue, a huge problem. Um, we just need more than one facility that can take those people on um, because you need to move them on so you can do the business that you want to do and treat the people that you're there to treat. So um, somehow we've got to look at uh, incre increasing that capacity wherever it is around the state so that we can get them into the proper settings. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. It, 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 you, you're raising that issue that, you know, I remember Senator Stenjum for years was always talking about that. Where, where's, our, where's that sweet gap that we need to really take a focus on? And you're, you're raising that piece. And, and if no, anybody's ever had a chance to see the work, Dr. Heath, that your folks do, HCMC does such a great job. At, and I went through the county, um, you know, Hennepin County Jail. And uh, I'm blown away. I mean, the, just the, the work and the folks that were there doing, doing the work that they were doing, especially when the recidivism rate of, an, of Hennepin County Jail is beyond. There's a need, a deep need on the mental health and substance use side. And, and your folks, uh, and I, the doctor's names were there, but HCMC, I, I don't think yeah, you get the credit that you need. And in this case, um, uh, know that I appreciate, you know, that's good work that's being done there. So thank, thank you for you. being here. Sheriff. Welk, how are things in the cast? Wonderful. Thank you for having me, Mr. Chair Hoffman and committee members. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. All right. I appreciate it. Um, like the doctor said, capacity is huge. Um, just adding 10 more is going to be significant. The last numbers I heard were 51 on the waiting list and um, there's just no place to put it, so we have to increase capacity. That's what every stakeholder has mentioned. That's what we can all agree on. Also, the in reading this uh, bill, it didn't have it scratched out the 48 hour. I know it's a work in progress, but it's so important that we have a timeline like the 48 hours that we uh, have ability to um, get them in a, a facility and out of jail. If, uh, people don't belong in jail. We can't warehouse mental health. Uh, people in need of mental health in our jails across Minnesota. We need to treat them like people and get them the right care they need. You know, uh, since 2009, there's been six different um, work groups, task force that have uh, convened and given reports. And this issue is well documented. It's well known. And yet we have nothing. I know if we had a $17.5 billion surplus last year, if we used 1% of it, we wouldn't be sitting here today. So I really appreciate the support and hearing this. And uh, Senator Mann, thank you for bringing it forward. And I know it continues to be a big issue and a big uh, lift, and we're all behind it. And uh, thank you for the time today. Thank you, Sheriff. Any questions for the good Sheriff? Uh, thanks for your continued work in this, Brian. I just. Um, to, to see that, and, and, and you're right, you know, that we know there's progress when there's folks always engaging about this, even to this point. Um, Senator Mann, a couple weeks ago, it was, you know, you were engaging to the point where it's like, well, let's, let's get something uh, that's better prepared, better right, and I appreciate your leadership on that, and thanks for, thank you, uh, Sheriff Welk. I see no questions for you. Let's go to Elliot Boutte from uh, NAMI, for the record. Thank you, Chair Hoffman, members. I'm Elliot Butai from uh, NAMI, Minnesota. <clears throat> um, when the priority admissions or the 48-hour law was passed, it was to make sure that people with serious mental illnesses didn't languish in jail after they were committed. It's important to note that people under the 48-hour law are often in jail for months before they even get committed. Uh, for years it worked, but then an increasing number of people were deemed incompetent to stand trial and committed. 
and an increasing number of people in Minnesota are struggling with their mental health. So with these increased needs and numbers of people committed, the only people that can be admitted are people from jail. Um, as you've heard, we're taking beds offline um, and people in the community can't get into uh, the care they need at the state operated services. Um, NAMI served on the priority admissions task force uh, and this bill reflects um, the recommendations of the task force to increase the capacity at um, direct care and treatment, um, increase the treatment provided in jails. I think of particular interest to NAMI, we, we need to go upstream and prevent people from going into jail in the first place by um, building our community mental health system. Um, and the new criteria in the bill is also really important so that we can decide um, the priority based on uh, the intensity of the treatment needs and the safety of the individuals and others around them. Um, and of course, the exception to allow 10 people to go to the hospital immediately uh, from the community. Um, so for years, you know, we've known our mental health crisis can't be solved through any single provision, and this bill proposes a comprehensive plan to address this issue, not simply a Band-Aid, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, if you want to make some room for uh, Commissioner Clark. Senator, Commissioner, you get to be a Senator first, right? I mean, isn't that, isn't that a higher form, isn't it? Or do we have to say Commissioner Senator? I don't know. Are you, you correct? Correct me on that, please. Both are wonderful opportunities, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Welcome. For the record, will you state who you are? Yes. Uh, for the record, Mr. Chair and members, I'm Terrell Clark. I'm a commissioner in Stearns County, uh, Minnesota. Um, I'm here representing. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're, you're shaking. Yeah. Uh, Sturds County, uh, I'm here representing the Association of Minnesota Counties, uh, Maxa and Micah, um, and as you heard from Sheriff Welk, we actually have had the sheriffs, the uh, county attorneys, the social service folks, and commissioners all working together to really try to better understand what's going on from different sides, and particularly want to thank uh, you for the work that you've been doing. Uh, what's really hard, uh, you and I got to talk about this earlier, is this is not a year that you've got a lot of resources to be working on, and a broader problem, as Mr. Boutte was just talking about, that really deserves both the upstream as well as some of the more intensely expensive, shall I say, uh, costs. So uh, two items with regard to this. I mean, we support the final task force report. I was one of the members for that and incorporating all those provisions, recognizing this is a work in progress. There's just a couple of items um, in addition to what you've just heard we'd like to briefly talk about. Uh, one is for AMC, the highest priority for this year is increasing bed capacity. Uh, both in community and in DCT. It's really critically important for all the reasons that you just heard about. We want to make sure that all people with mental health disorders are entitled to have care when and where they need it, and that if they've been civically committed, they should have access to the court-ordered treatment they require to achieve recovery. We all know that jails are absolutely not a replacement in any way, shape, or form for the mental health hospitals or secure treatment facilities or those community-based uh, uh, programs and opportunities. Uh, steps to mitigate problems um, that hospitals are now facing must not come at expense, or at least we don't believe they should come at expense, of those who are, shall I say, languishing in jail. I got to tell you, in Stearns County, we've had several people recently, once again, that have been waiting long periods of time, and it's very expensive, which we'll get to in a, in a different uh, provision on that. So from our standpoint, and this is something that we came to agreement in the task force, is that any changes to the priority admission statute must be accompanied by a significant immediate expansion of the DCT hospital capacity. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. changes in prioritization only expand the wait list problems and frankly, some real challenges for people who might end up then in jails. Um, what is in the bill? It would be a down payment. We know that we didn't get here overnight as you just heard. It's gonna take some commitment over time. Uh, but it would be roughly uh, 40 staffed beds at each of the two levels of click care. Um, and then my second piece was just really wanting, and I'm sure, again, work in process. We're just going to keep working together. Uh, the, the task force didn't get to 
um, nor was it specifically in its charge to deal with the 48-hour rule itself. And at this point, um, we, we really believe that it's appropriate to, to come back and look at the origins for that, um, why there, it's important to have that in addition to the medically appropriate bed. Uh, there really is some urgency with this. Uh, so we, at this point, there's been some agreement to come back and work with the task force about how should that rule change? What does that look like? What could be different? I know Sheriff Welk has probably some additional comments he could make about that as well. So we hope to go ahead and keep working on this together, all the members of the task force as well as the authors, so that we can really get a better understanding about where we're moving forward. We're not gonna fix this challenge overnight, uh, but we appreciate your being able to come up with some things that can be done now within limited financial needs on a, a, a challenge for human beings that really deserve dignity and really the best opportunities to live their lives as they can and from a public safety standpoint for our communities to be safe. And with that, that is all I have on this particular bill. Any questions for the good commissioner? To the bill? <laughs> to the bill? Okay. No, uh, yeah, no, to the... Yeah, that's the end of testimony, Senator Abler, and I just, you know, there, there's a couple of things that came out, the bed capacity conversation, too. I mean, it's like, okay, any ideas, and I'm liking what I'm seeing. So go ahead, Senator. Well, and Senator Mann, thanks for tackling this. Um, it's a big deal, um, and it's a real problem, and I think everybody that testified would be happy to have $150 million to uh, put toward this. Um, lucky you're sitting down. There probably isn't that kind of money. There probably isn't $10 million for this. Um, and so uh, the question I'm going to ask is, what if there's no money or very small money and hardly any tails going forward? Um, Alina, my local hospital group, Mercy and, and uh, uh, Unity, have, are concerned about the boarding problem. That's a big deal. Uh, their answer was to close a bunch of units and not have pediatric services overnight at Anoka, at, in Coon Rapids anymore, and hopefully people can find a spot at Children's. That's a really bad answer, and if Alina knows, I think that's a terrible plan. They should have talked to the doctors and come up with a better one. Um, so we're doing all kinds of workarounds. You have people camped out at the Hennepin County Hospital, camped out everywhere who should be going somewhere, and, and so a kudos to the task force. Senator Hoffman was instrumental in putting it together last, at least they're talking. Um, and so um, I think if there's that kind of money, then it's a nice bill, but I, I think we really have to dig in probably at this committee, uh, and what if, we, what if there's nothing? And I think uh, to that point, uh, repealing the 48-hour rule, which happens on lines 4.15 to 4.18, takes away the urgency uh, from the department and others to have to do something. Uh, even given the urgency, uh, the governor didn't really do a lot of work with these beds. He closed some other beds to open up some new beds, creating a problem in the SUD world to solve this particular one as part of the budget. Um, and I think there's a lot of things we bought in last year's budget and even this year's budget that don't rise as a priority of keeping hospitals able to serve pediatric patients available in their locales so they don't die, um, which is the concern I have as the outcome in my little area, but it's, it's true of other places. So um, I, I wanna commend the task force and just thank them for what they're trying to do. Um, you have a really good author, uh, Senator Mann, is um, you know, really you know, able to listen Maybe I'll sign on the bill if it doesn't get too horrible, uh, just to help you know that I'm committed to this process as well. Um, but I think, aside from the fact that here's a bunch of money we're not ever gonna get, I think we need a fair way to do this. And I, I don't know why we can't use the Cambridge campus. There's 36 beds there. We just gotta find staff. Um, compared to building something, there are little twin homes up there, and as an example, and to be creative about what possible beds could be available. We have some underutilized campuses somewhere. I know staff is an issue, but whatever you build, you gotta staff it anyway. And so I think it truly is a crisis, and I think that, um, I think we as a committee, Senator Hoffman could help the governor to realize in his budgeting that maybe this is something we really need to pay something for, and maybe find a way to find a $50 million plan that gets going, uh, because this is gonna become life and death for the people at every hospital where there's people boarding, taking up necessary um, 
ER beds, it should become regular beds and all that. Everybody knows all this, but um, I don't think we should feel content that here's a nice draft of something that would be nice. So thank you. But thanks, Senator Mann and the rest. Senator Mann? We're good. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Mann, for your work on this really important topic. Um, I think we discussed it in this committee a few weeks ago that I had a constituent who waited in the Ottertail County Jail for more than 100 days uh, before getting to Anoka and was um, in effectively solitary confinement um, uh, and unable to have access to health, you know, mental health treatment that this individual needed. And I think everyone recognized within the system needed but was on a waiting list uh, to get into ANOCA. Um, and I, I do think that funding to increase the capacity at direct care and treatment needs to be a core priority um, because we have seen the number of Rural 20s, we've seen the number of civil commitments, um, mental health crises across the state continue to go up, yet we haven't really seen a serious effort to increase capacity at direct care and treatment. And so to me, that's one of the most important pieces of this bill. And it's my understanding that there are beds available at both Anoka and St. Peter and other facilities, but just not the staff uh, to be able to open up that capacity. And, and to me, that seems like uh, kind of the, the first quick win that we should really be pursuing as a part of this work. Um, and I, I just, to go back to, you know, what, what does state government do and what should we be doing? The state of Minnesota has recognize that we need to have facilities and care for people who, who the state civilly commits for over 100 years. This is something that um, you know, generations of legislators have viewed as a, a core responsibility. Actually, back in the day, there used to be a separate committee that was just for state institutions that looked after our state hospitals and their capacity and the work that they were doing. And I think it's important, um, especially when we have fiscal constraints, to go back to the basics and make sure that we're doing that right and making that a key priority of this committee uh, and of state government overall. So thank you again, Mr. Chair, for hearing the bill, and uh, I thank Senator Mann for her work on this important topic. Yeah, I thank you, Senator Rasmussen. That's to that point, right? DCT, this is the whole conversation this committee started, you know, last year. But it's like, what does that look like and how, and these needs, and, and you know, it's 150 million, yet I hear some cross talk going on about, well, what if we do the Cambridge or there's a smaller building in Fergus Falls, you know, then Senator Clark, you were assistant majority leader. I mean, you know, what, what was going on? What could we be doing? And to that point, um, it's going to come from this committee. And so I appreciate your work on this as well. Senator Mann, any, any other thing other than anybody else? Senator Abler? Well, and, and, and so I wasn't trying to pan the whole thing, but it's, you know, the getting 10 people out of hospitals, like there's some that are like way on top of that list. I mean, those are, the 10 number is a practical thing we can do for nothing. But then that bottles up the system elsewhere. But, but I just encourage people, what can we do like right now? And how do we stop closing departments? And how do we stop injuring people who have been, you know, victimized by somebody that's been somewhere for more than a year who's really hard to serve? So anyway, good luck. And I'm happy for that. So, <laughs> Senator, you're going to go to judiciary from here and then... Am I? Yeah. Okay. You said it, not me. Yeah. You're going to be fine. I think this is still going to be something. Thank you for looking at the bigger system, the bigger picture on this. And think about what are, what are the things that we can do unless, you know, all of a sudden the governor ma magically finds $150 million, you know, yeah. sitting in the bank account, one-time money. Mr. Chair. Man, uh, Senator Mann. I think, you know, we have to point out that our health care system is falling apart. So this isn't going to fix even that, right? Um, this is just a small piece of it, of our completely crumbling healthcare system. And I would also like to mention that we did a lot of stuff last year, right? We housed unsheltered people. We poured money into public education, which was also in crisis. We increased access to healthcare. And no matter what we would have done last year, if we had taken this last year and not something that we did, we would be sitting here today talking about another crisis that we couldn't fund because there wasn't enough money to go around to everything that was falling apart and to everything that we did not invest in for decades. Um, and so to say, you know, we had all this money and then we didn't spend it in the right places, that's just, you know, that's just a disingenuous statement to say because we helped a lot of people and we changed a lot of lives. Um, having said that, 
again, there is some things that we can do now. I know the governor has some ideas of how to get beds open right away. Uh, but this is not something, even if we had all the money in the world, we could not fix this tomorrow because it takes time. It takes space. It takes people. Um, and that's all the things that we're going to continue to work on. And no one's listening, so I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Uh, you're good. This is still work. Thank you for doing this, um, Senators. I appreciate you. Um, Senator Mann, you want to take Senate File 4660 uh, as amended, be recommended to pass and re referred to <laughs> Judiciary and Public I Safety love Committee? To. So be it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you for your continued work on this, Senator Mann. Thank you. You might as well stay there, represent, or I just threw you over into the bus there. Senator Abler, as long as we're talking mental health and innovation programs, eligible recipients, and funding modifications, um, county responsibility. We just kind of touched on that briefly with this last bill. Um, the cost of care for a client waiting transfer to another state operated facility. Senator Abler, you have the same kind of thematic discussion in Senate file 5282. You have an A1 amendment, is that correct, Senator? Uh, it is true, and I also have an oral amendment. Um, if you just want to get the bill in order, then we can adopt the A1, and we'll talk about that after we talk about the rest of the bill. How's you want to do, so Senator Abler moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. aye opposed, same sign. Well, Senator Mr. Abler. Chair, I'd like to delete article, section six. Is that the right motion? So do you want to the hold The bill's on? a little too long, and it's a little duplicative, so. That's just, uh, we'll talk about the bill with what's left then. Council, you got that? Senator Section 6. I think a lot of people are happy to Go ahead, you want to make your oral discussion. amendment, Senator Abler, so we can act on it? I'll move to delete Section 6. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Senator Abler, now is the bill in the format you want? Oh, thank you. It, uh, the bill has become a little more novel with the addition of the author's amendment, but we'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about the main part of the bill and just in the interest of being. Uh, in my precision testimony, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Commissioner Clark. <laughs> Assistant Majority Leader, Senator oh, Commissioner. Yeah. The Honorable, certainly the Honorable. It's, it's nice to see and you. You also have uh, Youngerberg, Angela Youngerberg. She's joining us via Zoom as well. So do you want to go Commissioner first or you want to go? Let's do Zoom first. You want to do Zoom first? Angela Youngerberg, are you, are you Zoom? There you are. Welcome. For the record, do you want to restate your name and welcome back to us? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Angela Youngerberg. I'm the director. I'm the Human Services Director of Business Operations at Blue Earth County. Um, I am representing Maxa, Micah, and AMC today. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all. Um, in this bill, uh, the the piece that I really want to speak to today is about the county's cost of care, um, cost of hospital care. And that's a topic that counties have been working on since that uh, cost share was implemented. Now, there's a long history about it, but the biggest change that occurred with this was back in, I believe it was 2013, um, where the counties uh, received a sizable share um, that came to counties uh, for the, the cost of a person's care once they no longer met medical criteria to remain at a state-operated facility. So for some context, right now at Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center, uh, counties pay $2,106 every day for every person that's at the hospital that no longer meets the medical criteria as determined by the direct care and treatment staff. It doesn't matter if there's a place for that person to go to or not. If they remain in the hospital, the counties have to pay that full daily rate. At community behavioral health hospitals, known as CBHHs, uh, that amount, um, we have to pay 100% for um, each day that the person no longer meets criteria, and that amount is $1,818 per day. That amount fluctuates annually. Um, generally, it goes up by a little bit. Some years, it goes up by a lot. And so it's really uh, based on the cost of care rates established. We um, have had concerns, we continue to have concerns about this county cost share, uh, particularly when the individuals are not meeting criteria and they're in the hospital and they're awaiting to be transferred to another state-operated facility. 
Um, it, it's very different when a person is being uh, transferred back into the community. Uh, the, the county does have some ability to speed things up, create development. I mean, the county has a role in that local, local care. But when it's a transfer between uh, a, a state operated facility to another state operated facility, we really have no influence um, to, to um, speed that process up. Um, last year, the legislature passed a two year reprieve uh, from these charges for individuals who are deemed mentally ill and dangerous. So that's those that are in a state facility awaiting transfer, mainly to St. Peter. Um, to the forensic hospital. And I believe you heard last week in a hearing that um, the, the thought was the reprieve was permanent, but to clarify, that was a time limited two year reprieve. So that will be sunsetting. For context, in the last six months from July, well, not the last six months, but from July to December of 2023, those costs, just those costs for does not meet criteria for people awaiting um, transfer to forensics because they're mentally ill and dangerous. The cost totaled $8.5 million of, and, and that was paid by um, county uh, local property tax. You heard about a situation um, earlier in the session about Beltrami County, where one individual cost Beltrami County over $300,000 in property tax uh, levy while awaiting another appropriate pl a placement. And so these costs are very, uh, very high and they're not predictable. Um, you'll hear from Commissioner Clark today about some very real, very um, uh, current situations in Stearns County as well. And so these situations can cripple county, county budgets. And really the, the biggest uh, um, piece of this story, a most egregious part is that these county dollars are being sent to the general fund and they're not being reinvested in the system, which is desperately needed. Uh, for context, in 2023 in total, counties paid $26.2 million for all does not meet criteria dollars. So this bill is really important. It does three things. It relieves the counties of the costs uh, related to individuals transferring between state operated facilities. It redirects those dollars um, into the current mental health innovation fund system so that we can create uh, opportunities in the community and that um, it appropriates the necessary funding to DHS to increase, excuse me, that part was amended out um, earlier in, in this hearing. So anyway, um, in, in closing, the work that we've been doing on priority missions has been great. It's um, and it, it very important and it's been focused on the broader policy changes. Um, and the hope is to have alignment in language um, with the work that we've uh, discussed at the task force. So counties are very supportive of this collective work and appreciate the opportunity to testify and be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Youngerberg. Um, next up, we have Commissioner Clark. Welcome to bill number two. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for your work on this as well. For the record, my name is Terrell Clark, a Stearns County Commissioner here representing AMC, Maxa, and uh, Micah. Uh, you know, it sounds like that each of you are thinking about examples in your own counties, and that's, that's an important piece, and also knowing that people can move around, but thinking about what those costs are in Otter Tail right now, what that means, you know, it's just, it's a very difficult situation. Thinking about Beltrami, thinking about Anoka, thinking about Hennepin. Right, but behind each of these are really stories of human beings. Uh, so before I go to the stories of the human beings, just truly from a budget standpoint, this is probably one of the things that makes the least sense, at least in my head, about what happens with our state budget. We have property taxes coming from businesses, ag producers, residential that are ending up paying for this cost that Ms. Youngerbird described, and then at some point, it's just going to the general fund. It's not coming back to alleviate property taxes. It's not coming back to help with some of the services that have been talked about. So this is really something recognizing it could be a longer term issue that we really need to work on. Um, a few recent examples, uh, we've had two people who have been um, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And again, the cost is just over $2,000 a day. The one I wanted to give um, that is 
actually from last fall. This one wasn't even related to DHS. Somebody that was a DOC person had been in prison, happens to have come from Stearns. Uh, they were in AM. RTC waiting, uh, waiting, waiting, um, and it took about three months. Our, it was the cost for that one person in waiting was about $176,000, and then ultimately they went back to prison. So it's not something, as Ms. Youngerbert said, that we have any control over, and you don't necessarily even know what is happening. So when you put this piece together about our capacity and ability to really do something closer to home with our community partners, these big costs really are eating up. I will tell you issues relating to commitments to this type of care, and then if we want to add in our juveniles, that it is some of the, the highest, um, fastest growing parts of our budget. It really makes a difference on our levy. So anything you're able to do here, recognizing last time it was a one-time money. I know you're looking for a creative one-time money is until there's other other uh, resources, but there's a few different ideas that are here, and we'll continue to work with uh, Senator Abler, with Senator Mann, and others about ideas on this piece. Thank you. Um, Senator Abler, any comments before well, we go to my questions? Testimony on this. Um, actually, I'll, if there's any questions about this, I'll just have some comments and then move on to the next part of the bill. So, any questions from members? Members, any uh, questions for? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a technical question. Um, the deletion that we passed after the First Amendment, the amendment that we had starts with Section 6. So which did we delete? Is it the section, section 6 from the amendment, or is it the Section of 6? Of the bill. Of the bill. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. And, and, and Senator Abel, just really quickly, if it's OK, Commission, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Commissioner members, Clark. That's because it's aligned with a critical piece in Senator Mann's bill. Uh, we were going to spend a little bit more time talking about that if it had been in a different hearing. But since we'll have just talked about it, right. uh, you're going to be able to work on it moving forward in the other bill. Thank you. And so, Mr. Chair, just to the whole bill, stay here. It's okay. nice to have you around. Um, so. I don't know how many, there should be a little club of people who carry this legislation year in, year out. Uh, Senator Hoffman's carried it. Um, so this, this piece, like, wouldn't it be nice if the county share could go away? And I just, I did some research. It was done in 2016, which is prior to the watch where I, so I'm just happy it wasn't me. Um, because sometimes you wind up doing things, and it was my predecessor who I have a lot of respect for, but that was done as a budget choice. I do want to point out for people who are wishing we weren't spending the money this way, um, is that money then got spent for something else that people wanted that made sense at the time. Just to caution people who ever put a county share on um, in the future because it will happen. Sorry, Commissioner. Um, but if you put a finite number of dollars, like uh, when we did transportation, uh, I think we saved $3 million or $4 million way back when the county took over the non-emergency, whatever, transportation. Uh, that's grown quite a bit and just drops to the forecast. Um, and so it looks like we're richer and the counties are being drained in a way. Um, but anyways, this made sense at some time to that, um, that crew who was working on it. I was actually in office then. But um, anyway, so, and so I just, I'm going to offer a challenge to the people who are hoping we can find a way to get rid of this cost. Um, it may never go away. And Senator Rasmussen is kind of good at math. And so if you knew that there's a $22 million budget every year, every year, every year, if there was, if there was, if there was a way to upfront load $40 million through county bonding or some coordinated way um, to get this monkey off our back, now you have $20 million to pay for it. And the arbitrage on that, I think, could be kind of interesting. And so if people would have known um, back when these shares started happening that they were never going to go away, uh, then they could have made some decisions. And so that's my comment to Senator Mann, and I don't think we need to have two places to discuss the more comprehensive thing. And Senator Mann's approach is a comprehensive one, but maybe the idea about thinking the state's supposed to write a check for $150 million or whatever is a decision that doesn't make sense. And that's my point. I'm trying to be ingenuous um, as we're finding a way to get around this because Session's going to be over in about six weeks, and the chances of solving all this 40-hour rule stuff, um, there's a chance that something could be done, but how can we do something practical? 
and maybe there's a way to allow a county to exceed its debt capacity for this purpose, knowing it's gonna come back. Because the burden that goes on a property tax thing are on uh, seniors, in particular, that are on fixed incomes, and other people who just don't have the means. So, and so, and so then this, there'd be a way to, that's my, just my thought to you all. That's not what the commissioner wanted me to say. Um, but, but so, uh, we've been trying to get a check for some time. So I'm happy to be the latest in the line of people, and. So next year we can have somebody else carry this unless I'll do it again. Um, Mr. Chair, um, to the A1 amendment, um, and I wanna thank Mr. Monahan for working on really short notice to craft something. Um, if people wanna go to page 4.8, and the salient part is there. Um, and so uh, 4.8 to 4.10 about is the part that's the meat of this. and. Uh, something came to my attention lately, and I think I knew about it, but I kind of forgot. And that's if you're, uh, if you're, I don't know if every HCBS service is eligible for recoupment, but if you have some money um, and your family member is getting this, if you're a senior and you're in a nursing home and you have a, you have a estate, they're gonna ding the estate if you haven't divested your house, I think for five years or something. And, and so people are often surprised about that uh, in 20 sometime. Um, 13 or sometime, I don't know, some, Senator Lori worked on it and others, I think, trying to make it to go to the federal minimum. So as a federal requirement, you have to pay it back. The ABLE accounts that are so great are, are subject to recoupment. And so talking to the commissioner, this is an issue um, where people aren't aware. And I think it's become more robust, but on the old trusts that were done, I don't think there's been any understanding by the client, by the, by the parents, or by the client themselves that this is actually money you might have to pay back. And so the circumstance that provokes this is a young man had some kind of injury and got a settlement of one something million dollars, burnt up more money than that, and under bad advisement, the trust bought a house for them to live in. And so now as they recoup things, they're recouping the trust owned house. And so back to the financial planning side, if people knew that if you're gonna, in, like you have a, you're hoping your daughter or child lives a long time and, um, and you just don't even think about it and you're like so challenged with the day to day, you don't realize you're actually risking maybe even your own home, um, but it's certainly whatever has been uh, d divested out of that trust. Um, and you could do a much better way. If they were, they would, they, they, they could buy the house, the trust could pay rent or something, and then now it's a different asset and then people aren't being asked to leave. But, but so the provocation to this was, and I don't know if it's a county thing, maybe it, how they handle this, I'm gonna learn a lot about it, but I just wanted to call the committee's attention to this topic, which is, as long as I've been here, it was, it's still kind of news to me, and I know I don't know everything, but it's, and so the comment by somebody along the line was, yeah, a lot of people don't quite understand they're gonna lose their house. What? And it's the duty of this committee and maybe you know, judiciary or somebody eventually to, to solve this. But what this, what this amendment calls for is that if you didn't tell them, you can't take the house. Uh, if you didn't tell them with informed consent that they go with their eyes open knowing that this benefit is important enough to my family and my daughter, son, or brother, or whoever, um, that you're not, that, that you know. And furthermore, uh, talking to some people in the program, some of the bills that they're given for costs related to the program, nobody looks at them. It's an unintelligible list of items. And talking to one gentleman you and I have in common, Senator Hoffman, he's convinced that there was no value for some of those services. And now we're gonna recoup somebody's house over services that were very slackily, that were um, overseen. Um, and Mr. Chair, just to remind one more thing and then I'll close, is that the counties hire, um, oh, to the two of you. Um, so the, the counties hire uh, contractors and agents to manage some of these things and they don't feel responsible for the, for the work done by those subcontractors, which to me um, is amazing. And we gotta figure something out about that. So Mr. Chair, um, I wanted to call attention to this, Mr. Monahan. If this ever goes forward, there'll be another amendment to make it cleaner. But this just says if you didn't know, uh, you're not accountable. And I don't think I'll get to that point, but there should be strong knowledge 
along the way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll stand. Whatever, chairs, and I'll stand for questions or anything. Thank you, Senator Abler. Uh, members, anything for final follow-up? Thank you very much. Hearing none, um, Senate File 5282 will be laid over for, for possible inclusion. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Senate File 5249, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Senator Utke, for getting us through to this part. Senator Rasmussen, you a little Otter Tail County Engagement Services pilot project establishment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss the Engagement Services pilot project uh, in Otter Tail County here today. Um, Mr. Chair, members, when I first ran for the legislature and just started knocking on doors, I'd ask a simple question. What's the biggest issue facing you and your family? And I was uh, very surprised to hear the number one concern from the folks I was talking to was mental health and behavioral health concerns. And it didn't matter if I was talking to law enforcement, uh, teachers, uh, healthcare professionals, or just everyday people, this was something that came up over and over again. And earlier this year, had the opportunity to talk uh, with a very brave young woman who lost her husband uh, to suicide. Um, and she told her kids that uh, she was going to do something, and she reached out to me. And uh, from conversations based off that, we worked with NAMI and Otter Tail County Human Services to come up with the bill that is in front of you today. It would establish an engagement services pilot project that would take referrals from a number of sources. It could be a family member, human services, uh, healthcare institutions, law enforcement, uh, with the idea and the goal of making assertive attempts over at least 90 days uh, to engage the individual, uh, the family uh, providers with the goal of uh, getting the individual into uh, voluntary treatment. One of the concerns that uh, we've heard broadly and then specifically from this family who was impacted uh, was individuals who were not willing or uh, were not interested at the time of engaging in a voluntary mental illness treatment. As a part of this, um, they would also uh, have resources to work with families to engage in suicide harm reduction and provide uh, access to other services that may be contributing to their mental illness. Additionally, as a part of this pilot program, MMB and DHS will evaluate it on the impact of decreasing civil commitments, increasing engagement in treatment, and decreasing law enforcement interactions. So Mr. Chair, to answer the question, why Otter Tail County? Uh, I think it's important to uh, reference a report that was done by the Center for Rural Policy and Development that rural parts of Minnesota and Otter Tail County have higher suicide rates than the rest of the state. And if we look at rural suicide rates uh, from 1999 up until 2021, they have doubled. And so this is a real crisis, uh, and Greater Minnesota is where we're seeing uh, the largest increase and in the, the highest suicide rates in the state. As a part of this, and you'll hear from Otter Tail County, uh, one of the testifiers, uh, they have been very engaged in this work with the state on suicide prevention and have a group and resources that are dedicated to this effort. Um, and they're also very committed to figuring out and working with MMB and DHS to evaluate the impact of this type of engagement services pilot model. And if successful, Mr. Chair, the idea would be to take this model uh, and expand it to other parts of the state as interested. So with that, I'll hand it over to my testifiers. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you for your constant um, work in this. And it looks like you got Deb Showstrom um, from Otter Tail County, and then Elliot, if you want to come back down and, um, and join the good Senator, we can do that. So, um, Ms. Showstrom, are you, there you are. Welcome back, Deb. Here. Yes, here I am, thank you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity, Chair, and Senator Hoffman and committee members. My name is Deb Schustrom and I serve as the Director of Otter Tail County Human Services. I appreciate again this opportunity to share comments regarding the work we're doing in Otter Tail County that we believe positions us well for a pilot as referenced in Senate File 5249. 
The most recent community health assessment and a community health improvement plan for our region, like much of Minnesota and nationwide, identifies mental health as a top well-being concern. The 2022 Minnesota student survey data shows a concerning percentage of youth reporting symptoms of depression and anxiety, and a glaring number of youth have contemplated or attempted suicide. Substance use is also prevalent. Ottertail County has been working to address these concerns in several ways. In 2021, Ottertail County Human Services and the Ottertail County Sheriff's Department collaborated to develop a community reentry jail social work position due mostly to the growing number of people in the jail with mental health concerns. This work started in November of 21 and the jail social worker meets with people who are incarcerated. Since August of 22, the current social worker has completed over 1,136 initial assessments. Her work is to assist people to transition back to the community and access the services and support needed to reduce the likelihood of recidivism and to be successful in the goals they have for themselves. Ottertail County Public Health has been awarded a four-year comprehensive suicide prevention grant from the Minnesota Department of Health. The county will use these grant funds to build onto existing measures in place and additional action planning to aid in suicide prevention. A coalition has been formed. It's made up of public health, human services, pastors, educators, counselors, law enforcement, and most importantly, parents and survivors. Many people contact 911 when there's a mental health concern or a crisis. Ottertail County Human Services, in partnership with local law enforcement, has implemented a coordinated response program. A social worker with Human Services partners with an officer from both the Fergus Falls Police Department and the Ottertail County Sheriff's Department to screen call to coordinate a response to those experiencing mental health and or substance use disorder concerns. The goal of this work is to connect with people in need before they enter the justice system and at a time when engagement may prevent the need for civil commitment. Ottertail County Human Services is dedicated to continuing to institute work and programs that can assist people to access the services and support they may need before the level of need is so great that it's a civil commitment that's being considered. In Ottertail County, as well as the state of Minnesota, pre-petition screenings and civil commitment numbers have been continuing to grow over time. In our county, approximately 60% of screenings result in a petition being filed, and the other 40% have not met the statutory requirement for a civil commitment. If pilot program work in Senate File 5249 would provide the support needed to build upon the work we've been doing. In the testimony in the bills just before this one, you heard about a need for additional bad and service capacity. This pilot would provide for resources to support additional engagement, which in turn could reduce the need for civil commitment while assisting people and their families at a critical time in their lives. Thank you so much for this opportunity today, and I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have. We're just thank you, uh, Senator. We we're just talking about some. We had uh, up in the Todd County, um, Ottertail County area. It's in Senator Utke's backyard. There's a couple of resources up there, and our, we were just thinking out loud just about how it's a it's a natural, you know, um, intersectionality here that needs to happen. So I didn't mean to uh, offset that, but that's what happens in this committee. You start thinking, hmm, you know, where else is that? So thank you, um, thank you, Deb, for for enlightening us with your knowledge. And once again, and it's 60%, 40% piece just absolutely blows me away. So, um, Elliot, you wanna state your name again and, and it's all yours. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Elliot Butai, uh, NAMI, Minnesota. And uh, I'd like to speak briefly today from the perspective of the individuals and families who call NAMI's helpline. Every year we get thousands of calls um, from individuals like um, people that Senator Rasmussen's talked to, um, who we mentioned earlier, sit in jail for a year before um, getting help. And you know, before being arrested or hospitalized or committed, many, many families try to get help. And while it's not true for every family, many times when a person doesn't have insight into their own illness, conversations about treatment can put serious strain on family relationships. And when a person's not willing to engage treatment, Sometimes family and even friends aren't the right people to keep pushing. Um, but when these families seek help from the county, the answer is always, are they a danger to themselves or others? This builds for families and individuals who can't and should not have to wait to get help. 
Engagement services allow a county to send someone to engage people for up to 90 days. This means a mobile crisis team or a homeless outreach worker or a peer specialist could engage a person. And if that person says no thanks, they can come back the next day and ask them again, build rapport, and hopefully um, work to avoid these incredibly costly arrests, hospitalizations, jail stays, and commitments. We often hear that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And in a year when we don't have many pounds to spare, we think this pilot would be an ounce well spent. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for our senator? No? Um, I think we're just, we're gonna lay this over, unless you wanna go to the, no, it's, it's got money attached to it, so it's good. Um, but yeah, that's uh, possible inclusion, we'll lay this over and let's talk about, let's talk about the connection, I think, connect with uh, Senator Rutke uh, or Senator Abler. We identified who, we know who that, you know, next, Todd County. Um, uh, just, to, I think this is a, a great opportunity to really uh, deal with the issues that David talked about. So thank you, Senator, for bringing this. So with that, um, Senator Rasmussen, we're just gonna lay this Senate file 5249 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So thank you. Thank you. Senator Asperson, did you uh, let Senator Weber know about it's his first time in front of this committee that there's a, you know, there's a, isn't there a tax or something that we have to? Oh, there's supposed to be treats. Th thank you, thank you. S Senator Rutke. I, I would too, I was gonna bring my coffee as well, but apparently Senator Abler. Mr. Chair, I think he's trying to bring in the alumni rule because I think he was here under a different administration um, to be in front of this table. There may have been a different person sitting in your chair at that time. Senator Mitchell, is there such a thing as an alumni rule within uh, rules uh, at all, do you know? Uh, in this committee, I never know quite how the rules are gonna go down. <laughs> Senator May Quaid, uh, you know, the other body, you know, stuff like this. I mean, what, what is this alumni rule thing? Uh, Mr. Chair, I wouldn't do what the other body does. In this Thank committee. you very much. There you go, Senator Mitchell. Anybody else want to? No? Senator Weber, man, it's a joy to see you. Welcome to the Human Services Committee. You have a wonderful bill up, Senate file 5264, and you got Amber Brun, Bruins, Bruns, Bruns is joining us via Zoom. Correct. So uh, you're going to talk about uh, granny pods or musky today? What are you talking about? So. Actually, Mr. Chairman, neither one. <laughs> uh, and it was always my understanding that the, when you're the first, your first time in front of a chairman, that the chairman was going to provide the treats. So I, evidently, That's the rest good. of your committee members had it wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> But thank you for agreeing to hear Senate File 5264 today. And uh, just to give a brief overview of the bill, this establishes emergency relief grants for rural EIDBI providers. Uh, and and uh, this, as you go through the bill, establishment and purposes is to uh, provide these grants for those providers in rural communities. And uh, reasoning for that, I will give to you shortly. Uh, the bill also outlines what the eligibility is for those organizations to receive these grants and primarily deals with the fact that many of these providers uh, are losing substantial amounts of money as they attempt to provide the service. And in rural Minnesota, uh, there is a serious lack of providers uh, to offer the service in the first place. And uh, quite frankly, uh, and also the, uh, the appropriation amount at this point is blank. Uh, I know what uh, my uh, local uh, Southwest West Central Service Co-op, uh, what their projected losses are for their group that provides this service. Uh, I don't know exactly how l large this might be on a statewide basis. But one of the, some of the facts that I would like to share with you today, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and committee members, uh, is the fact that uh, I held a mental health hearing in my district last fall, invited county commissioners, uh, staff, and ed education superintendents uh, to be there. And I asked for concrete ideas of what we could do in the legislature to help them uh, with the needs that they have. And Ms. Bruns uh, came to me with a couple of suggestions, and one of these are these grants. 
It's my understanding, Mr. Chairman and committee members, that actually there was a grant uh, program included in legislation up until the last minute uh, last year. And then at that point, uh, it was changed to a 15% increase uh, in the rates for services. Now, that rate increase was appreciated uh, because there had not been an increase for, this would be for medical assistance rates. There had been no increase in those rates since 2013. And we recognize that the 15% that was provided really hasn't even kept up with inflation for the last two years, let alone the increased cost prior to that. And so uh, at this point in time, uh, I have brought uh, this bill to you. Uh, it's the projections of the Southwest West Central Service Co-op that their, uh, op their service will lose $600,000, uh, 23 to 24, to provide the EIDBI services. And the unfortunate thing, Mr. Chairman and members, is that it's my understanding that these EIDBI grants have actually been one of the most successful efforts that have been made uh, to treat our autistic, or to diagnose and provide treatment for our autistic children. Uh, at this point, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to turn the testifier's table over to Amber Bruns, who has more information to share with you. Thank you. Any questions for the good senator? Amber Bruns, uh, for the record, please state yourself, and, and uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Amber Bruns. I am the Clinical Director of Behavioral Health Services. I'm here representing the Ready Clinics uh, with Southwest West Central Service Cooperative and would like to express my strong support uh, for Senate File 5264. Um, at the Ready Clinic, we are a small provider of early, intensive, developmental, and behavioral intervention, or EIDBI for short. Uh, we provide services in an 18-county region in southwestern Minnesota. Our clinics are located in the rural communities of Montevideo, Cosmos, Pipestone, and Marshall, providing both diagnostic evaluations and intensive treatment services for young children under the age of seven with autism spectrum disorders and related conditions. Uh, back in 2016, we began researching and building our business plan uh, to provide the service in our region. At the time, there were 13 providers in the entire state, with 12 of them being in the metro. We were hearing stories of families having to uproot their lives and leave their support systems to gain access to needed services. Our goal and our mission has been to help fulfill these service gaps for families with some of the most significant needs. Uh, since beginning clinical operations in 2019, the Ready Clinic has faced significant barriers to providing EIDBI services in these rural communities. We, like many of the other rural providers, are in immediate need of emergency grant relief uh, to sustain our, cl our clinical operations and to continue to serve families in our region. On the document that I've provided, you can see that some of our challenges are significant. Our challenges include long wait times and increased demands for services. Um, on average, we're receiving seven to 10 new referrals every month for families in need of our services. This is a year over year increase in the demand for our services um, providing this medically necessary service. Currently, our waitlist time for diagnostic evaluations is currently over 200 days, and many of our families are waiting for over a year for in-service for on-site in-clinic EIDBI services. We also experience challenges with our transportation expenditures. Our families incur higher costs for travel uh, between our clinics uh, just because of our geographical distance. Many of our families are driving for over an hour to a ready clinic location because there are so few providers in our area. Significantly, our workforce shortage issues are continuing. Uh, we have uh, significant expenditures to recruit and retain qualified staff to deliver services in these small communities, areas that have already experienced a shortage of direct support workers and health care providers already. As Senator Weber mentioned, we've experienced gaps in reimbursement rates for our services. While reimbursement rates for services did improve as he described, the current rates still create monthly and annual shortfalls for organizations like ours. The margin for each billable service does not allow us to cover our operating expenses, recruit and retain staff, and ultimately uh, inhibits our ability to grow our services and serve more families. 
Um, as Senator Weber mentioned, um, our financial gaps are significant for our agency. Uh, since our operation began in 2019, we have had a total deficit of slightly over $1 million. This fiscal year, we are estimated to experience a $600,000 uh, financial loss. This kind of financial loss, um, it, this is not sustainable for these services um, in the long term. As a result of the last session, the 14.99% uh, increase in rate reimbursement was appreciated and we are thankful. It did allow us to have two of our locations have a break even in the month of February for the first time ever. However, this increase is not enough and it has not helped control uh, the significant loss that we are experiencing. In the document provided, you can see there are attached maps that even though nearly every county in Minnesota has families seeking EIDBI services, there are a limited number of service providers who can overcome these barriers in greater Minnesota. Without an immediate emergency relief grant like the one established in Senate File 5264, many of these providers are likely to close within the next 12 to 24 months under the weight of consecutive years of financial loss. In the Southwest region of Minnesota, we represent 55 counties. There are only two providers and a total of five communities in our region. There was one other provider in our region that has left earlier this year. Um, if our ready clinics are not providing these services, there are no other options. As I mentioned, we are aware and grateful for your efforts to establish rate changes that meet the needs of all EIDBI providers statewide. These efforts do not go unnoticed and are already making a difference to service our families. However, we are currently asking for this emergency grant program to bridge the gap so service providers like us can remain open um, as others, excuse me. Uh, we strongly believe that we, where you live in Minnesota should not determine your access to high quality, life-changing EIDBI services. We also know that if we and other rural provisors close, our families will be faced with leaving their livelihoods and support systems behind to seek services in other parts of the state. I thank you for your work in this committee to ensure the families we serve don't face these difficult choices and can remain in their southwestern Minnesota communities with access to the services they need. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. Ms. Bruins, thank you so much. And it's just um, thank you for your work because it's the EIDBI when you start early. You know, you're, you're actually, there's, I wish you could capture the savings on the special education related services that a child would have gotten if he, he or she didn't get the work that, you know, was done on early on. So Senator Weber, thank you for bringing this. Senator Abler. Well, just to pile on briefly, you already said it pretty well, but, you know, Senator Weber and the people watching, this EIDBI thing was a long time coming. Yep. Uh, it took, in my opinion, far too long to get it rolled out. Um, I think there's barely a thousand uh, people, uh, children in the program, something like that. There's a, I think a pool of up to 15,000 who could perhaps qualify. And some of the, well, the science, not just anecdotes about how the, these individuals have turned their, their lives become different from it. So I want to thank the staff who are doing this, but uh, Senator Hoffman, this is one of those things, mm -hmm. uh, pay a little bit now and just on the money, and then you pay a ton later, right? but never mentioning the challenges that these yeah. individuals face in their whole life. So anyway, it's a, hopefully we can get some grant money, but I don't know why the rates are so bad that we can't um, get them to go. And maybe we need to look at that because then that's more than 50% reimbursable outside of us. So. And that's what I was asking. Thank you, Senator Abel. That's the question I shot over to you is like, you know, when isn't this reimbursable, but yet the 14.99, it's like there's I'm, there's a gap in here I'm missing, and I think it'll be good to have that conversation as we look at <clears> it. Mr. So, Chairman. Senator Weber. Thank you. Uh, you know, and, and from what I understand, actually uh, a large majority of the, uh, the children that are treated in this program uh, do come from families that are receiving medical assistance. And let's face it, we all know that the medical assistance program has notoriously underpaid providers for that service, for the services rendered. And, and uh, it causes a number of problems within the entire medical system. Sure. And, and uh, so um, I think that's, that's why, and they're seeing an increase in the number of people that are coming forward. And as she mentioned, they service eight, 18 different counties. 
And for example, my home county, which is in the very southwest corner of, of Minnesota, if their pro program were to cease operations, uh, the next closest program uh, it would be in Wilmer, which is 140 miles away from Laverne. And uh, so um, we know that's important for them to be able to keep these four centers going that they ha currently have right now. Uh, and so, and I have, uh, I have reached out, I left a message for the executive director uh, of the uh, service co-ops and to, to try and get a, a number as to what that is uh, statewide. We all recognize that quite frankly, part of the issue is location. Uh, you know, there are issues up in the metro area too, but there are also more providers and, and that are closer by. And, uh, and so I'm trying to get a handle on what that would actually be. Ms. Bruns also mentioned the shortage of workers in this field in the first place. Yep. Uh, this um, is an issue, actually Senator Utke and I were at the International Legislators Forum meeting last summer. And a speaker there who was the speaker at my hearing, uh, informational hearing back in November uh, mentioned that within the higher education programs in Minnesota who provide training for people involved in this uh, area, in mental health area, there were 105 seats that were empty after registration last fall. Hmm. And so we have the facilities available to train but we do not have the people that are going into the industry uh, and, and into that uh, particular vocation. And, uh, and so that is something that we also in the future need to be working on. Thank you. Thank you for that bit. You know, the other thing that, that is, um, I know in the EIDBI that in the rate study recommendations, right, that they're in there along with mental health and substance use. And so this is perfect timing for us to have this conversation and so, um, members, I think any other, Senator Mayquaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Weber, for bringing the bill forward. Um, I, uh, the president of one of the letters that you put forward as a, as a constituent of mine and, and met with me to talk about how important this bill is, and so I, I always appreciate when constituents make things that are a little bit, uh, you know, ethereal for us in committee, more real. And the other thing that he did bring up too was about the um, behavioral analyst licensure, which was a really important piece to this too. And so I think your bill plus that bill together is gonna to bring us some really good results here in Minnesota. So I thank you for doing the, all the work, yeah. Agreed, Senator Weber. Thank you, uh, I appreciate that. And uh, I certainly uh, hope that uh, there will be uh, some room for d doing this and I will keep you uh, inform Mr. Chairman as to what other numbers I receive. Thank you, and I, with that, I think, you know, if uh, Christy Grom maybe wants to do a follow-up conversation with you about what, what does this mean kind of thing, that would be wonderful. But yeah, absolutely, you've got our attention, uh, and I appreciate you uh, coming here and not talking about, you know, what you were, <laughs> I'm not gonna go there because it's not, it's. <laughs> I noticed the evil grin on Senator Utke's in your face when I showed up. Here, yes, so. that's okay. We're we're good with that. Yeah. The blank appropriation was on the sheet, and I looked at Utke, and it, you know he's the he's the one for you know anytime anybody has a blank appropriation, you can get. We know Senator Utke's going to ask the question, so we're trying to all beat him to the punch. And I went over there to try to beat him to the punch, and. You noticed it, that I brought up the issue before yes. the question was asked. <laughs> I saw that. So we're going to lay this one over for possible inclusion, and then uh, we thank you for your time, and, and uh, definitely um, uh, thank you, Ms. Bruns, for all your work that you're doing. So with that, thank you, Senator Weber. You know, Senator Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's invite him back again. Oh, any time. I, I think we, we that like to be, have him in that chair. I, I think maybe he should. We should find room for him to join our committee. You know, don't you think? See, <laughs> he's leaving. Um, let's go, Jody. Uh, Commissioner, you want to come on up, and we'll. Uh, and Elise Bailey, you want to work up, and then it looks like we got some folks. Senator Abler, the gavel's yours. Do you have your sheet about who's? All right. I know. Um, can we get some more chairs up here too? Because I might, might as well have a conversation. So. 
So you're going to, I'll just get going while you move. Yeah, get, so welcome to the weapon. committee. And so we're here to talk about the governor's budget. And I've always just wanted to know, how much does the governor really know about this budget? But we'll just leave it at that as a rhetorical question. So I know he's fully committed to whatever you think of. So mm -hmm. commissioner, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. Wait and there's a PowerPoint you're going to go through here. or? What? Why don't they? Or you can just start talking, Jody, if you want, or whatever, so. Nice to have you back. We haven't seen much of you here just recently, so That's nice true. to have you back. It's good to be here. Thank you so much. And I uh, would like to present the supplemental budget recommendations of the governor's office here uh, for the um, session. And um, so, uh, starting with our mission statement that uh, we work with many others helping people meet their basic needs so they can live in dignity and achieve their highest potential and I'm pleased to say that as we separate our agency into three separate agencies we are rewriting this mission statement for what we're calling the new DHS because this is outdated. The impact of our programs, 48% of children in Minnesota are served in some way by the Department of Human Services, 27% of the adults, 17% of the older adults, and 37% of people with disabilities in Minnesota. Transformative investments from last year, let's all remember that while we're quickly trying to resolve the bills for this year making substantial progress to improve human service programs that serve more than 1.5 million Minnesotan residents. We took important steps to strengthen the child care industry, support the well-being of all Minnesota children, stabilizing working families, addressing the workforce crisis in home and community-based services, and addressing deep poverty and homelessness. Improving equitable access to behavioral health services and health insurance coverage, particularly for children with much more to go. Uh, authorized the Department of Children, Youth, and Families and the separate Department of Direct Care and Treatment to make it easier to access comprehensive services and bolster patient care. If you look at the governor's total supplemental budget, not just in this jurisdiction, we had 18 proposals across human services, children and families, and health and human services. Focusing on critical needs such as increasing the state's capacity to serve people needing behavioral health care, deploying strategies to assist people with complex needs to leave hospital care when they no longer need it, reducing opioid overdose through the 1115 reentry waiver, investing in vital infrastructure supporting the child welfare system, developing an agile response to emergency needs and operational needs as the agency reconfigures. And with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Elise Bailey to go over the ex exact uh, budget proposals. Elise is our budget director. Ms. Bailey, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Chair Ibler and members of the committee. Uh, happy to be here. And before I get into the details, I just want to um, give a shout out to the DHS team who um, has spent the the last year putting together these proposals in addition to implementing all the amazing things you um, implemented or enacted last year. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go uh, through a few of the proposals that we have um, in this jurisdiction in the bill before you. So the first proposal is expanding access to direct care and treatment care. This certainly relates to the bill that Senator Mann um, had presented earlier today. Um, and has a few of similar components within it. Um, the goal of the proposal is to increase capacity at direct care and treatment for adults and kids um, based on some of the priority emissions task force recommendations and to increase um, access to behavioral health care across the state. So we have a few different components within this proposal. Um, we're looking to invest in the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Hospital or CABS program. Um, and this would increase um, the program to full capacity, which would add eight additional beds. Um, we are also looking to increase access to mental health care for adults. Um, in this component of the proposal, we are um, shifting resources from the care facility at St. Peter into a forensic mental health program, um, repurposing those resources to free up 16 additional mental health beds. Um, we are adding coordination with jails. So one component is to really assist the jails in um, serving people with high behavioral health needs. So this proposal would provide support and technical assistance to those county correctional facilities. 
Um, and then we're looking to do future policy development in the area of uh, mentally ill and dangerous um, people, um, developing a commitment reform task force to optimize the use of our state resources and increase equitable outcomes for people um, in that program. This proposal is 3.9 million in the first biennium and 3.2 in the second. Um, and as I go through this PowerPoint, we've put page numbers on here um, to that link to the change page document that um, folks at home might access online and I believe um, in member packets. Chair, would you like me to just keep going or? Um, I think you want to fly through your okay. PowerPoint and then we can take questions. That'll be more the most efficient, I think, because maybe the questions will be answered as we listen Sounds carefully. Sounds good. Sounds good. The next, the next proposal is certainly related to um, the DCT increasing access to care. Um, but this is centered around people who are stuck in hospitals, who no longer meet the level of care in hospitals, um, but are having difficulty finding care in the community. So they're stuck there um, for longer than they need to be. So we have several strategies in this proposal. One is providing waiver services in the hospital. So to improve continuity of care um, and the experience for people with disabilities when they enter the hospital um, for acute care, this proposal would provide flexibility to allow, um, if they're a current disability waiver um, recipient, to allow their worker to provide services to them while they're in the hospital. This um, has previously not been allowed. Um, on the federal level, and um, this proposal would enable us to seek um, approval um, with the feds. It also supports future policy development with the PCA program, so we can kind of tease out and develop policy recommendations for um, that to take place with PCA workers as well. Um, one key component in this proposal is removing the backlog of min choices assessments. So right now, um, an initial assessment has to has a 60-day limitation um, um, from the date that the person is assessed to when the services are authorized. Um, this proposal removes that limitation and allows that assessment to be open for 365 days. Um, to remove the back backlog and um, potential duplication for that person um, as, as counties are working through their case. Um, we're also removing the experience requirement for registered nurses um, to increase the applicant pool for assessors um, in min choices as well. Um, the third component of this proposal is adding a new um, enhanced budget and rate exception process for older adults who are on the elderly waiver program. Um, this would enable people who have complex, high needs um, to have a higher budget um, and, act, and enable them to access elderly waiver services in the community. Currently, um, there is some challenges for people who have exceptional needs because um, they have to fit within the current budget structure in the EW program. This is a repeat proposal from the governor's budget um, that we had in last year. Um, the next proposal is supporting older adults through the alternative care program um, by adding transitional services to this program. This would help people who are on AC, um, who want to move from a facility into the community. Um, it would assist them in doing that. Um, and then lastly, uh, the last uh, strategy in this proposal is assisting tribal nations to support people with disabilities and older adults. Um, we would work with tribal nations in this proposal to develop a tribal MA, Vulnerable Adult Development Disability, or VADD, um, targeted case management benefit. The next proposal is reducing recidivism and preventing opioid overdose. Um, we know that people who are re recently released from incarceration in jails and prisons are up to 40 times more likely to die of an opioid overdose than the general population. So with this proposal, we're seeking to really save lives by supporting people when they exit um, those facilities and are uh, returning to the community. We have two components in this proposal. One is providing ongoing funding for the Bridging Benefits Program. Um, this is a current program that we partner with the Department of Corrections, um, where we assist people who, are, um, who have a high likelihood of recidivism and we assist them in connecting them with benefits while they're being released from um, uh, prison. It has a high likelihood of, or a high um, um, outcomes in the current program, and we have a cliff right now. So this is just providing ongoing funding for, um, for some short-term funds that we got um, a few years back. 
Um, the second component is creating a Medicaid demonstration project um, to reimburse physical and behavioral health services in prisons and jails for 90 days before a person's release. And I'll go into a little bit of uh, um, detail on this um, project. So currently, um, unless we get a waiver from the federal government, we aren't allowed to provide Medicaid in a, in a jail setting. Um, this proposal would create a new benefit, a new waiver, um, and it would um, help people um, who are car incarcerated partic in participating facilities who are determined eligible for MA to access a defined benefit up to 90 days prior to the release. Um, DHS will collaborate with the Department of Corrections, local governments, tribal governments um, to determine a streamlined approach for determining eligibility for folks. Um, eligibility determinations would occur at DHS. And then upon release, um, people will have access to the full benefit set with the goal of um, helping folks to access behavioral health supports while they're um, in jails and prisons and then having a streamed line access to the full benefit set when they're released so that they have a continuity of care um, at, at release. Um, this 90-day benefit will um, only include a certain amount of services. It won't be the whole MA benefit set. Um, on the screen, you can see the list of services that we're including, including care coordination, uh, making sure that folks have coverage for prescriptions and a, a 30-day supply upon release, um, SUD comprehensive assessments, treatment coordination, peer recovery, um, individual and group counseling, MOUD and uh, MAT. Um, the benefit set will also include mental health services, family planning, OBGYN, and physical health services. Um, this will be a first phase of a multi-phase project. We are starting with um, three state correctional facilities. This will be two men's prisons um, and one women's prison in Shakopee. We'll also include two locally operated juvenile facilities, um, four local adult correctional facilities, and one correctional facility owned and managed by a tribal government, or one that has an inmate census with a significant proportion of tribal members. Some other key details. So this is a big project um, where collaboration is key. So in this proposal, we are developing a council to inform the development of the benefit and the implementation of it. Um, coordination is really key with people who actually have lived experience and have experienced incarceration either currently or um, in the past. Um, their families, DHS, DOC, tribal governments, counties, cities, community partners and community-based organizations and providers. Um, this proposal requires resources at the jails and prisons. Um, it will be a big shift to require um, providers to bill Medicaid in instances where they're not currently, uh, they're not currently set up to do so. Um, and so in this proposal, we have resources for the Department of Corrections as well as $3.75 million over the horizon to assist local facilities in their planning and their implementation of the project. Um, CMS also details that evaluation and is key to this um, project, and so we also have resources in the proposal to um, set up a, a detailed evaluation plan from the onset um, in order to really um, develop future phases of this project and ensure that it's, it's successful for people. Future phases could include um, more locations across the state, more services, um, and we'll certainly incorporate lessons learned. The next proposal is um, what we've titled the Human Services Response Contingency Account. So this proposal is really looking to strengthen our ability to respond in an agile way to emergencies that occur outside of legislative session and outside of the budget process. Um, we have titled, we have patterned this off of the existing public health response contingency account, which is an account that MDH has for responding to um, emergency disease outbreaks. Um, and we're building on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, where we found that having an agile funding source that was flexible um, was key to an effective response in, in um, instances of an emergency. This proposal puts um, one-time funds of $10 million into this account and, and details in the, in the bill um, reporting requirements um, to the legislature from the department when, when funds are used. 
Um, we also have a proposal around direct care and treatment separation authority. So this is a, um, similar to a bill that I think Senator Hoffman has already heard before this committee. It gives key details or key changes in order to do the final shift um, of direct care and treatment into their own agency. Um, so this proposal would shift the separation date to align with the next fiscal year. Um, it would establish the executive board and it would specify different statutory requirements that DCT will need to have as a standalone agency. Um, another proposal we have in the bill is a disproportionate share off-ramp. So this proposal sunsets um, the disproportionate share program, which provides a rate floor for customized living services paid for, the elder, paid for through the elderly waiver program. Um, currently, the rate floor is applicable to people with lower needs and does not reflect a methodology centered around what's provided to the person. Um, this proposal fulfills previous legislative intent for the program to end once EW 24-hour customized living rates were fully funded, which um, thankfully occurred in the 23 legislative session. Absent the floor, um, because that rate increase occurred, um, eligible facilities would have received a, about a 45% increase on the aggregate if the floor had not occurred. Um, existed. Um, with the existence of the floor, they, they saw about 68% including those floor increases. Um, so at the end of the day, this proposal, we're just seeking to ensure that rates paid to providers are based on the needs of each person and they're based on um, what the provider is providing to, to the person. Some other key um, very interesting proposals, no, uh, budget neutral proposals. Opioid allocation modifications and sunset elimination. This kind of um, goes in both jurisdictions. Um, we have some changes in this proposal around the child welfare formulas um, that are funded through the opioid allocation model. What's germane to this, um, this jurisdiction is we are looking to preserve fees on opioid manufacturers and distributors um, to provide ongoing funding needed to address the escalating impacts of the opioid epidemic. Um, so currently, there is a sunset in current law um, of the fees that we get from opioid manufacturers and distributors. That sunset will occur in 2031. Um, this proposal will eliminate the sunset to ensure that um, the resources that are received from opioid manufacturers to um, help with the opioid epidemic continue um, to be received while there is a current epidemic in this space. We're also looking to add the Director of Office of Addiction and Recovery um, to the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council, or OREC, as a non-voting advisory member that is budget neutral. Um, and then also in the bill is a budget technical cleanup proposal. It makes um, different technical changes um, to carry out um, the policy changes approved by you all last year. This includes fixing certain carry forward amounts, effective dates, and other um, very technical changes. Lastly, um, I've linked some key resources in the back uh, for folks to dig into deeper. <coughs> With that, I'll let stand for questions. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Hoffman, should we date the public testimony? There's only a handful of people. Yeah, I think so. There's a couple of people, Mr. Chair, if you would. Right. There's, a, there's an A24 amendment. Yeah, let's, we, you want to do that? You want to yeah, move let's, that? Let's or? get the A24 amendment out of the way, and then I'll, then we'll just all hang up here, and you know, some folks come over that want to talk about this, and then we can go back to talking with... Um, so the, Senator Hoffman moves the A24-0288 amendment. Is there an 0287 line? Never mind. Um, it's author's <laughs> amendment, um, plus the department wants it. So anybody uh, who wants to say the department can't have their amendment. Um, anyway, all in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. Opposed. There you go. You're winning. So let's uh, hear from the public testimony. Yep. Uh, Ms. Guerin and Hubert, and then Mr. Coleman be on deck. I can, we can move, yeah. I can move down and at least. As you wish. Down. Sit in front of the dais yeah, if you want. Yeah, they can all good. Yeah. At least can, yeah. Don't, don't go it. too far yeah. away. Yeah. But yeah, there's, there's only three public testifiers. So. You only get three? Yeah. Yeah, you have room for Lauren. Yeah, right. sorry, Mr. Yeah. Coleman. Anyway, so uh, why don't you guys, long-term care folks, uh, offer us your thoughts and welcome to the committee and who's first, go ahead. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Angela Guerin with Care Providers of Minnesota, here today on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. 
Thank you for the opportunity to respond to the governor's budget. But first, I do want to thank the legislature and this committee in particular um, for the $300 million in one-time funding to nursing homes in the form of debt consolidation grants, workforce incentives, and temporarily increasing um, the reimbursement rate by leveraging federal Medicaid funds last session. Those one-time dollars help struggling providers keep their doors open in a time of crisis. We also recognize the $412 million that was committed to the elderly waiver program for community-based services for low-income seniors and assisted living. However, funding in nursing homes was one-time money and providers are now facing a cliff. And those funds dedicated to EW only brought rates to the 2017 levels and thus EW is not fully funded especially when recent inflation is factored in. When the governor's supplemental budget was released, not only were we disappointed that funding for senior care providers was glaringly absent, it eliminates the Disproportionate Share Program, or DISH, that provides assistance to facilities who predominantly serve low-income residents. Mr. Chair, I would like to turn it over to my long-term care imperative partner to conclude our remarks. We can see your long-term friend, Belki, your long-term yes. imperative partner. Welcome. That is well, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Erin Hubert with Leading Age Minnesota on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. And we have been working with a few of our uh, DISH provider members to estimate the annual impact of said setting the rate floor as proposed in the governor's uh, supplemental budget bill. So as a few examples for you, a site in Brooklyn Center uh, is projected to lose about $1.1 million annually a site in St. Cloud is projected to lose $1.8 million annually. In West St. Paul, they have projected a $1.1 million loss. In Bloomington, Minnesota, a projection of $177,000 uh, me, $177, annual loss. And in Buffalo, a site has an estimated shortfall just shy of $500,000 annually. So if the rate floor ends without recognizing current wage data in the elderly waiver methodology, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for these facilities to continue operating. Um, more broadly, I will say we are seeing improvement in our workforce capacity, though it is not back to pre-pandemic levels. Caregiver vacancy rate in assisted living is around 15%, and in nursing facilities, it is just under 20%. So again, while we do very much appreciate the one-time investments that were made last session, without any ongoing or sustainable investments, the benefit of those stopgap measures will be lost. Thank you. Why don't you two stay there just, and then, so I think we'll take a few questions of the three of you, and then we'll clear you out and go to the, the department. Mr. Coleman, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Abler and members of the committee. My name is Lauren Coleman. I am a retired long-term care services provider and spent the last 15 years of my career at DHS as the Assistant Commissioner for Aging Disability Services, nursing facilities, and a whole host of other programs. The Elderly Waiver Disproportionate Share Program is an idea I came up with after I observed that low-income seniors had very limited access to modern assisted living communities. It has been acknowledged for many years that the Elderly Waiver Customized Living Rates were not adequate to support the services required by low-income residents. The consequences have been most providers limited waiver residents to less than 15% of their communities. This program has been a lifeline for the assisted living communities that have a waiver population of at least 83.5%, a very high bar to qualify for the program. The rate increase for the elderly waiver services last year were great, as already mentioned. Thank you, it is greatly appreciated. But, as also mentioned, it was based upon 2017 wages and don't reflect the current wage pressures created by the pandemic and the shortage of workers. I will acknowledge, as suggested by the commissioner, that some residents have lower needs. But there is a phenomenon in this uh, arena of aging in place. We don't want people to have to move multiple times over the course of their aging. I believe that there is a plan that would improve the process rather than the sudden termination of the rate floor as proposed by the governor's supplemental budget. 
DHS is required to complete a study of the elderly waiver rate methodology and the cost to provide services by collecting from providers wages and non-wage data and present an interim report and recommendations to the legislature in February of 2025. I would suggest no changes to the program this year. Consider the recommendations in the report when available and then make informed decisions based upon the actual provider data. This would be far less disruptive than the sudden termination of the program for 27 facilities serving 900 low-income Medicaid residents throughout Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. And uh, maybe we'll take some brief questions of the three up there. Anybody got a question? Oh, I thought you had something, Senator Upke. Yeah. And then Senator Makeway, and then we'll probably move on. So go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess I don't have a, a lot of questions on this portion of it. I got some on the rest of it. But the fact is that long-term care got left out of this uh, equation is very concerning. Um, it's not something new. We've had conversations for the last two or three years on the serious position they were in. And so I'm, you know, uh, with the amount of money that's in here, there's not tons of it, but hopefully we can redirect some because um, what, we, what was appropriated last year is running out. And by the time we get back here next year, um, they're going to be in a world of hurt. So hopefully we can do something to help get them bridge this gap because the problem isn't going away. Um, so uh, that's I'll have more later, but for on, on this topic, it's uh, it's kind of disheartening that this was not included. I think you kind of summarized the view of the committee. So Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering if the department can respond. I mean, oh no, we're going to bring them up. I'm just if you have a question for these three, then we're going to oh, kick them out, and then okay. we can have the department. I'd like to have. I mean, this kick them out. That sounds so harsh for our long-term <laughs> friends. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you for the three of you. Uh, your excuse, Commissioner. If you want to come back up, and uh, Senator Makeweight has a question for you. I have some questions too, but we'll uh, go ahead, Senator Makeweight. Thank you, Mr. Yours. Chair. Yeah, I'm. I'm just wondering if the department can respond. If the wages are based on 2017 wages, are we? How are we at 100 percent? Can we talk more about that? Ms. Bailey, Commissioner, whichever. Uh, Chair Ebler, Senator McQuaid. Um, the way that the, the statute is structured, um, it was structured where we added a framework rate methodology to statute, and then the statute said X percent of the rate is this new rate and Y percent is the old rate, because at the time, the legislature didn't have enough funds to fully implement the rate in 2017. When this disproportionate share program got put into law, it said this will expire once the new rate methodology is fully phased in, meaning at 100%. We, um, when that happened, it passed last year, there was a cross-reference that was um, missed where it was um, pointing to disability waiver services, which aren't applicable to this program. People on disability waivers don't receive the rate floor. Um, however, it was ambiguous enough where the department felt like we didn't have legal authority to sunset the program. That is why we're coming forward this year. One reason is that the original intent of the disproportionate share program wasn't about the data within that methodology. It was about whether it was phased in 100% and the old methodology was out. So that's why there's a whole argument around is it fully funded, is it not? You know, under a plain language reading of the phase in, yes, it was. But there was this weird cross reference issue. Um, I would say the bigger reason why, though, it's a really centered around making sure that we have um, payments and rates set in place that incentivize caring for people um, in, in righteous ways or that the rates reflect the actual needs of the person and that they reflect the actual services being provided. When you have something like a rate floor, it incentivizes providers to take people who are low need um, because they will receive a rate at a level maybe the same or higher than somebody with higher needs. 
And we have a system right now where we're finding really challenge, a really challenging situation where it's hard to find um, providers to take people with higher needs. So it's really about kind of restructuring the system and ensuring that we're incentivizing the right thing through our rates, rate system. There's also um, concerns that, you know, because this is building based or facility based, you know, um, low needs and people in poverty could be put in one building because they get a rate floor there um, and, and other folks might be put in, an, in another location. Um, so there's, there's potential for perverse incentives when you structure a rate methodology around the provider rather around the person. We are doing in our whole package, taking funds that, you know, this is a savings proposal. We're taking that and investing in a new budget category for people with high needs on the same program, the elderly waiver program, so that we are able to serve um, people with complex needs that we're incentivizing the right thing and that all of the rates are centered around um, what a person needs and that we sufficiently um, you know, pay providers based on, on the services that they actually provide. Senator McQueen. All right. And actually, I just want to thank the, I don't thank the department. I want to thank the academy. I want to thank the department uh, for interpreting the funny cross-reference in a way that I thought was uh, charitable to this project. And just to remind what you already know is that a lot of places don't take any elderly waiver people. Um, what got me going on this was there was a certain place in Ramsey that I won't burden you with their name. There's only one of them, so you can find them. Uh, this friend of mine's mom spent down to poverty for several years. They said, oh, there's, you can just go an elderly waiver uh, when you spend down asterisk based on yep. space available, which was yep. two. And that seems to be across the industry, which is yep. where the, where the genesis of, the, of this program. Um, I, I'll hold my questions for a bit. Uh, Senator Aki, did you have a question or any, you want to bring up? Did you did, want to say something? Did, did, was Sorry, oh, Senator Mr. Hoffman, yeah. Mr. Chair, yeah, was, were you, I mean, this is this, the conversation that uh, Senator McQuaid really started. I mean, that's really, as, you, as we're getting in this, we're, we're getting the, the opinions from every angle on this one. And you know, our committee, we're going to have to do something or not do something this year, right, on, right. based on this. And I want to make sure, Senator McQuaid, did, did that help put in perspective on the, on the piece on that? And it's so, okay. anyway, I just, yeah. thank you. Sir, our key is waiting to talk about something, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and my comment was going to be, uh, there's a few other things here too, but, you know, it came up in the slides about the people that are being housed in our hospitals that need to um, go on to a mental health facility of some sort. Um, and my thought there or my, what I would like to see is, I think we all know the problem if we see a little bit more of, about what would be the department's idea on solving this or a, 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 I don't know if there's such a thing as a cure, but your plan to address the issue. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't really see that. I see that there's, you know, there's some requests for money and these type of things. But to me, um, drilling down a little bit more on the plan and I would like to see then what is our current budget on these things? We see what the additional ask is, but if we saw what that budget was, this is what we'd like on top, and this is our plan to get us out of this predicament. Um, I guess just a thought. That's what I would like to see as I, I look at these things. Well, sir, okay, maybe just given the purview of our committee, we don't actually have the hospitals, uh, but there is a plan within our area of DCT Correct. that you might want to talk about. I was going to ask about that too. Um, and so it seems like we might be losing some beds, but Senator Hoffman, did you want to comment no, about no, that? I think that would be good to review and that. And I was just, I think maybe Dan, I mean, as we're talking about what is that rollout, when we're looking at DCT, that is a hospital system, but it's, you know, under their purview of us, it's like what, what other alternatives could exist within that structure that, you know, we should be having that conversation yeah. now. And it's and like, the proposal, though, there's closes a gap, some, right, Senator? I mean, the proposal closes some mid-need beds and makes them into high-need beds. And yep. so let's... Let's take a minute or two and talk about that. I mean, it's already pushing five, and um, I don't know if we have to quit right at five, but if people have to go, they can go. But, Commissioner, you're good for a little bit yet. Sure. What time? No, oh, my God, it's five. Now let's five. maybe go till 5.10. Is that okay? Yeah, I think. 
Because yep. we want to give this the, the honor of its proper. Yep. So can we, is 510 okay, Commissioner? Sure. Okay, so why don't you do a minute or two on the change, but not very long, because we, I mean, I read it, it's been pretty clear, but um, I'm, I'm especially concerned about the unintended consequence of losing the mid-level beds for the SED people. Um, but if you want to just talk about that on your own terms, that would be great. Thank you, Chair Abler and Senator Rucky. When and you Dan talk about change, are you talking Marshall. to DCT? No, I'm talking about when you're closing the care beds and opening yeah. up some other beds. Right, right, got it. Okay, so um, working with the uh, co-chairing the uh, Priority Admissions Task Force, we had a rich conversation across community um, for several months. It was really helpful. We also, uh, some of us uh, visited the Anoka County Jail and then the Hennepin County Medical Center Emergency Department. We all learned a lot from that that we brought to the work. Um, we all appreciated that we were we are sitting in the middle of a perfect storm of a of a higher prevalence of behavioral health needs in our community coming out of COVID, as well as fewer providers of behavioral health services and a workforce shortage. So uh, really difficult at this point in time to uh, fix this. Not to mention a slimmer forecast as we came into the session to try to bring proposals together. So. Um, the proposals we have brought in here in the governor's budget are particularly focused on the things we can do immediately. There were proposals discussed to build another building, uh, which would not have allowed us to add capacity for another two to three years while we built a building. So while nobody was happy with having to close anything, uh, the, the simplest solution was to trans transition some of our services from the substance use services to, uh, to the higher level mental health care needs. And so that's the proposal that we brought forward. Um, what you don't see in here, because it wasn't a budget request, is that we're also looking at um, reopening a facility of 16 beds at DCT and working our darndest to staff it. We had it closed for some time because it's been difficult to staff, and so we're planning to start again with that. Another recommendation of the Priority uh, Admissions Task Force was to work with our hospital decompression uh, transitions unit in our aging and disability services to work closely with DCT as well to see what we could do to open up capacity. Um, in the five weeks immediately after the end of the task force, we moved 47% more people out of DCT than we did the same five weeks the year before, uh, doing all the things that we could with our whatever it takes fund and working with various community providers to see who can take more people and what would it take for them to do that. In the last couple of weeks, we've moved a person who was stuck for 500 days. We're about to move a person who was stuck for 600 days. And we're starting to open up DCT capacity just working closely with counties and with community providers to take folks um, out into open capacity. And as you know, then the um, our Priority Admissions Task Force also recommended at least 10 patients from hospitals be added to the wait list for DCT services so we can move civilly committed people out of hospitals and into DCT. So those are some of the things that Thanks. we are doing right now. So we have a new attendee, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, you wanna say something? No, just here to answer questions. Can you please give me the summary of beds, given all the things, there's the, there's the 10 that you're gonna reallocate, which is not a new one, it's not a loss or a gain, it's just a different group of 10. But with closing the care ones and the 16 one I forgot about that you just did, um, is there a net, so how many, you're closing some SUD beds, which, too bad, but I mean, we, we prioritize here, I understand that, so do you wanna? Mr. Chair, he might wanna introduce himself. No, he will, yeah. His job is, I mean, I just. Who are you and why are you here? But if you could just give us <laughs> a, just a thumbnail, like a one minute answer to that question. Thank you for inviting me, Mr. Chair. I'm Wade Brost. I'm the Executive Director for the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Treatment Services Division of Direct Care and Treatment. Yeah, so I just do want to answer that question about the, do you know the, the net gain? Like, how many, how many DCT, high need, you know, forensic beds, whatever you want to call them, leaving Anoka, et cetera, are gaining, and then how many are you losing on the carers, SED side? Can, do you know that? Counting yes, that 16, Chair. you were talking about that's not in the budget. Including the 16 not included? Yeah. Give you credit for that. Thanks. So we have the eight beds at CAB, the 16 bed repurpose in St. Peter, the 16 beds the commissioner is referring to. So 40 beds. 
that's the bed increase. And as we look at the utilization of those beds, as, she, as the commissioner was uh, detailing, we'll have better access to the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center. So while not increasing beds there, we are anticipating uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 admissions during the first year. All right, and how many care beds are you closing? 32. 32, so it's, all right. And what do you think is going to happen to those folks? I know you think about it. Yeah, so we, we will continue with high utilization and other two programs. Those individuals, um, while, while they did serve people committed to the commissioner, will continue to do so in our other sites. We'll have a longer delay um, to admission to a DCT substance use treatment center, but we'll continue to serve the same client population. Thanks. I think it's important to remind people about the 16. That makes your story sound better. Um, I'm excited that that well, story. It's like, you know, we all have to have people understand. Um, stick around. Um, so, and I'm glad there's an MIND reform task force. Um, my question for everybody who's going to be on there and the governor is, will there be the will to actually implement the findings of that task force? I, for one, have thought that some of that programming is unconstitutional. The court decided differently. Um, I think some of those folks don't belong there at all. Um, but that's a really tough political thing. So I wish you well on that. Um, and I have a question about the contingency count. Um, I guess that's a matter we have to trust. Um, it's nice to have money around. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, I'm just one vote and not the decision maker anymore. But it, um, it seems like if there could be some constraining uh, instead of doing anything that may, there might be a finite list of things that really are the priorities. Because uh, sometimes then somebody has a, an idea that, oh, this would be nice, essential, important, and nice. I think moving people out of HCMC that had been there for two years would be a high priority and nobody would mind that. I think some little program to have a little, th there's a hierarchy of, of needs that you have and maybe there's some way to craft that. Um, any other questions from members? Um, and so can I ask, Senator Hoffman, did you want to ask anything? No. Um, okay. No, I have a couple I, I more questions. Lay, this is the, yeah, don't lay it over yet. But we're going to lay it over. And not yet. You can't. Wait, I didn't bang the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to revisit old topics, um, and so there is some critical need in greater Minnesota for NEMT work, and there's a, there's a tiny ambulance bill, which is not in the purview of us. Um, and the nursing homes continue to just not thrive. Um, do you want to tell me, Commissioner or whoever, how you think that the silence on this bill is going to work? <laughs> and I know you have many mouths to feed, but can you comment about that, please? Um, so first of all, um, there was a fair amount of funding last year. Um, we also have, uh, in the forecast, increases because of the VBR payment system, just like last year. Um, and, and so there's not nothing happening uh, for our long-term care facilities in Minnesota. Um, we've also continued to monitor uh, the data, and we continue to see um, staffing at the current um, salary levels for people in our nursing home facilities, and uh, fewer people going there, partly because there are fewer people being sent there by the managed care organizations, which used to have a hospital to nursing home to home path, now asking for a hospital direct to home path. So there are fewer people going there for that reason. Also fewer people who are private pay going there to simply want to live in the nursing home. Um, and so we appreciate uh, that there are troubles um, and we see it as, as much as a, a consumer choice issue as it is um, additional funding. I, I appreciate it. I know that's the best answer you can give. And I, I do not want your job, Commissioner, so don't worry. I'm trying to somehow take it over by asking my questions. Um, any other questions from members? Um, and so... Uh, and Ms. Bailey, what's the total price tag on the bill net for the two biennia? Like one year and then the two. Mr. Chair, 18.1 million in the first biennium um, and 
14.9 in the second. A total of 32.99 or 98 million. All right, that's helpful. Um, well, before we lay it over, I just want to thank the department for their work. They have an impossible task. Um, and the people in the audience um, wish things to be different. Uh, I think they should sit in your chairs and uh, see how they like that, um, given all the constraints, both mathematically and politically, that you have to figure out. Um, but I'm, I want to thank Senator Hoffman for letting me sit here again doing the governor's budget uh, as uh, we're committed to doing the best we can, and I appreciate his leadership as he's going to have to sit down and craft something to deal with the gaps. Um, anyway, Senator Hoffman, you want to say anything else? As I'm supposed to sit down and deal with the gaps? No, that's why we have a committee, Senator Abler. It's, oh, yeah. Okay. You know, Fine. I'm just... We, I think this is the conversation. This is what I don't like about having two-hour hearings when you have a topic like this this is huge because this, this really is what drives human services is this budget. And so I wish we could have spent more time really having a conversation like we just did, really, because you got, you know, having Elise and, and, uh, yeah. and Jody up here, it's really nice to have that. But I, I still think we got a lot of work to do as a committee in order to get to where we need to be. And, um, and that, with that, I, I think that's all I have to say, Senator Abler. So. Senator Hoffman, I'll just remind you, when you invite them back, they will come for that conversation. And, and, and thank you. And I think, David, we want to get, I would like to, it, as we get to the markup time, I want to have, I want to be very focused on, you know, just as we look at what we're doing. And, you know, it's nice to have um, the person with the checkbook sitting next to me, that Elise Bailey, because she forgets more in a day than any of us will know. So it's kind of nice to have. But with that, Senator Abler, I mean, we're... Well, thank you. And um, I don't know if you announced Mr. it, Chair. but if there, we had time for, I had a few testifiers today. If there are people that have thoughts, both uh, with concerns or things they're happy about the governor's budget, uh, if those are sent to, to the uh, committee, they will be put Chair. out, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I imagine they would, because we want to know. Uh, and we can't possibly have all you come talk. But anyway, with that, uh, thanks for a good hearing. We're adjourned.